looks good. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first NSF Live of 2021. My name is Thomas Burkhart, editor and reporter for NASA Spaceflight, and I'm joined by two of my favorite friends here for the first episode of the year. Let me know that you can hear me and that you can see us. Thank you for tuning in for the first show of the new year. Introducing my guests first off on this side, back on NSF Live, Mr. Philip Sloss. Philip, how are you doing? Good. Good. Good to be here. Philip Sloss, the SLS reporter extraordinaire for NASA Space Flight, and also on the other side, Mr. Chris Gebhardt, a very familiar face here on NASA Space Flight Live. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How about you, Thomas? I'm doing well, and we are here to cover another week in space flight news and look ahead to what could be a very exciting 2021 in space flight, with uh, the big topics at play being the two super heavy lift launch vehicles under development here in the U.S., both of which will have very exciting milestones coming up this year. The old SLS and Starship vehicles, we'll be talking about both of them. But first, we want to just do a quick recap of last week, the final week of 2020, with two orbital launches that took place. And we will begin over in China on their final launch of the year, a Long March 4C rocket carrying the Yaogen 33 satellite. This was their final mission of the year, actually reflying a launch attempt that went that failed the last time. So this is a replacement Yaogen satellite. Uh, serving the Chinese satellite fleet. Uh, that was the final launch of the Chinese year. They had the second most launches worldwide uh, right after the United States, another very busy year. And next year, they're looking forward to another busy manifest as well as launching the first module of their new space station. So China's space program staying active going into the new year as well. And then I want to hand it over to Chris G, who will uh, wrap up the final launch of 2020, which was the Ariane Space Soyuz launch with CSO2. Chris, what's going on? How did Ariane Space close out the year? Yeah, so they uh, closed out their year by launching a French military satellite. Um, so this was the um, this was the second of three planned CSO uh, satellites. They are optical imaging uh, satellites. The first one and the third one uh, are going into or are and slash are going into 800 kilometer orbits. But this one that was the final launch of the year is going or was placed into a much lower orbit, so it can obtain even higher resolution. Uh, imagery. It's uh, primarily a military satellite that will be available not just to France, but to other European allies as well. Um, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, and Spain um, were some of the examples already cited with either agreements already in place or pending agreements to use the information from the satellite as well. Um, so yeah, it was the 10th flight for Ariane space of the year and the fifth using the Soyuz. So the Soyuz is a workhorse rocket, not just for Roscosmos and the Russian military, but also for air and space and the European community uh, as well, doing uh, half of their launches this year. Uh, and it was a great launch, uh, very successful, the Soyuz STA, which is a modified 2.1A Soyuz rocket. Uh, most notably, it has different ignition systems on its engines, uh, a flight termination system, uh, a European payload adapter, uh, and a few other European improvements to help it survive the humidity of the tropics down there in South America. Uh, the mission went perfectly um, with the frigate and the upper stage placing the satellite into its proper orbit and then deorbiting itself so that it did not become space debris. On its own, a very highly successful mission and a great way to end the year. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And to those of you tuning in, as always, this is a live show and we want to bring questions and uh, talk about interactive discussion with everyone who's watching. So if you have a question about anything we're talking about today, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if you tag us with at NASA, NASA Space Flight, we will be able to see those questions better. And also, it has nothing to do with where in the message. I know someone last uh, stream asked, does the NASA Space have to be at the beginning or at the end of the chat? It doesn't matter. If it's in the message, we'll see it. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to do so. And we also can't do these shows without the super chats and the support that come in. So really quick, we've got one from the Moldy Space Industries with the 2021 super chat. Nicely done. Uh, it's not an NSF 
life without Thomas Fan Club, Chris G, 2020. Uh, thank you. Happy New Year to all, and here's to an exciting year ahead. Thank you, Moldy Space, and thanks for tuning in. And then uh, also, we got a super chat about something we're definitely going to have to talk about in a little bit. Catching a super heavy with the launch tower is maximum bonkers. <laughs> Great coverage in 2020. Here's to a better 2021. <laughs> Hashtag Thomas Fan Club. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, yes, we're definitely going to have to talk about that crazy super heavy idea that Elon threw out. But uh, first, we're actually going to start with the other super heavy lift launch vehicle because we've got the SLS expert in the house, Mr. Philip Sloss. Philip, let's give an update on where the orange rocket is nowadays. The one based off that one. <laughs> right, right. Well, the, uh, so we haven't actually heard anything, but um, uh, a couple of weeks ago on, it was Sunday, December 20th, they uh, took a second shot at the wet dress rehearsal run. Uh, Stennis Space Center in Mississippi is just outside of New Orleans. And they were able to uh, successfully tank the vehicle, um, got through the entire fueling process, go into stable replenish, and you sit there and you condition the the uh, engines and the and the rest of the hardware for uh, the ignition sequence. And then they went into the terminal countdown uh, demonstration test where they pick up the count at 10 minutes and counting, and they are supposed to go all the way down to 33 seconds. Um, but on the 20th, they were uh, only able to get down to about four minutes and 40 seconds. And then they had uh, one of the uh, uh, pressurization uh, sequences. Uh, one of the steps in that sequence was to close the liquid hydrogen replenish valve. And what happened was it just closed a little bit too, uh, too slowly for the, uh, the limits that were set in the sequencer. And so they held the clock at four minutes and 40 seconds and they troubleshooted it for uh, a couple of minutes. They don't have very much time at that point in the countdown and they realized that they couldn't continue. And so they stopped there and then they basically finished the test, which was you recycle the vehicle back to 10 minutes and then you get into the into the securing, you drain the vehicle. And uh, the, the test actually lasts for another couple of days because just like any old launch vehicle, you have to drain the propellants. You have to let you have to let the tanks inert. Um, hydrogen is a, is a pretty flammable uh, uh, um, commodity to deal with, so they have to wait for uh, almost two days after the uh, after the fueling. Um, but since then, we really haven't. We, we got basically just the barest of updates um, the next day, and um, at the time, or actually prior to this, in the attempts, the first attempt was on December seventh. And that was the one where they didn't have the cold enough liquid oxygen. Um, we got a uh, we got an update in uh, the week after that. Um, but since the second attempt, um, obviously we're in this holiday we uh, two weeks off this holiday fortnight. Um, so we weren't expecting to get a lot, but uh, I suspect that uh, the SLS program has been working almost the entire time, with the exception of probably Christmas and New Year's. Um, so hopefully we'll hear something um, in this in this first work week of the year that's coming up. Um, they were talking about a two week peri uh, time period between the um, the wet dress and the hot fire test, which is the the eight minute long test firing. But um, this is the first time they've done this with this vehicle, and they're also being very careful because this test article is also the flight vehicle, and so uh, it's not. Uh, quite the same as as a uh, uh, as a prototype, um, so uh, they have all of these safety protections in there, um, and they're actually trying to test and see that the limits that they set for the core stage that they wanted to use the exact same set of limits that they're going to do in launch count. So um, I have a feeling that there's a lot of tweaking that they're doing, not just to the the issue with the the one valve that didn't close fast enough, but they're probably also looking at some of their other uh, test commit criteria and seeing if there were other things that came up uh, during the tanking um, and making some adjustments to that. And then we'll just have to, we're just waiting to hear whether they've decided to proceed into the hot fire test or um, or perhaps they might, uh, uh, they might repeat the wet dress um, we really haven't heard anything one way or the other. Um, in the meantime, um, at at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, they'd gone ahead and stacked these two. You can see on the screen right now. That's the 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 left hand um, solid rocket booster aft booster assembly, um, 
and that was the first that was the first of the ten segments stacked on the mobile launcher, and this was back uh, just before Thanksgiving. Um, and so they put both of the app booster assemblies on the mobile launcher, and then they waited. Um, this is back obviously before the the first attempt at the wet dress, and since they uh, didn't complete it on the seventh, they decided to wait. And uh, since since the second attempt um, wasn't fully completed, we're not sure whether they've gone ahead and started stacking the center segments um, on top of these two uh, on top of these two aft booster assemblies or not. Um, there was some talk that they might start doing that um, in the past week, the week between Christmas and New Year's. Um, but uh, since a lot of people are off, we'll have to wait and hear uh, what happened. Um, and this is just uh, this is just uh, video of this is the video of the right hand aft booster assembly. Um, and you could see it being uh, uh, moved across by the the crane. Um, the foreground in this picture would be high bay four, and it was going over to high bay three. Now you're looking down in high bay three at the mobile launcher, um, and you can see they they actually bring it down through the the uh, platform hole where the core stage will be, and then slide it over. Um, and so uh both of these were done i think the second one was done um after thanksgiving but i, I they i believe they got them both secured on the mobile launcher uh, uh before the end of november and so now they're just waiting and what we're looking at here is uh in the 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 uh the upper left there they have these things called shoes that are on the aft skirts and those will actually stay behind when the vehicle lifts off now we're looking at uh the uh, surge 2 facility um, the facility where they store the booster segments is called the Rotation uh, Processing and Surge Facility, and so they have multiple buildings. This is the building where they've got the other eight segments, and those are basically we're waiting to be stacked, and so we'll, we're waiting to hear whether they started picking up those segments. Um, and you saw the big um, partially completed worm logo. Um, this is just some animation that was released uh, relatively recently showing what that's going to look like. It'll be in the in the middle segment of the the five uh, for each booster, and so uh, you can see what that'll look like. And so um, the uh, so basically um, for the green run, we're waiting to hear what they're going to do next. Um, we're not exactly sure uh, if they were to proceed into the hot part. We're not exactly sure when that will be. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of questions, and we're, we're basically waiting for NASA to uh, update us on that. Um, a couple of other things uh, that I uh, that I uh, brought along to talk about. Um, one of them was at least a big programmatic milestone, which was the uh, exploration upper stage critical design review, and that was completed on uh, December 18th. And that um, what we're looking at here is a, a, a breakdown of all of the systems in the EUS. Um, this is actually an old diagram. They did redesign it slightly um, to optimize it for lunar payloads. Um, uh, before there was a, a mission, uh, a mission designed to do planetary uh, uh, planetary uh, probes. They can still do that, but it's they've optimized it, and this is the new render of the stage. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the oxygen tank at the bottom there in the silver um, is more of an oblong shape. Um, they, they took out most of the barrel section in the middle of it, so it's kind of more football or um, uh, rugby football shaped. And then they also, uh, they're also using uh, on the RL-10 engines at the bottom, it's a four engine upper stage. Um, and this just shows this evolution. So on the left, you've got the block one vehicles, um, the crew on the left and the cargo on the uh, second from the left. And then the block one B will be where you replace the, the uh, interim cryogenic uh, propulsion stage with the uh, exploration upper stage. And so the next steps will be to, um, they will start uh, standing up production of the, uh, the structural test article will be first. And I'll just, uh, that'll be, Basically, all of the all of the inanimate uh, elements of the stage will be built, and then that will go to Marshall Space Flight Center for structural testing. 
and then after that the plan was to do them in serial they'll then do the uh they'll then start putting together the flight vehicle which will be the structure and then all the moving parts propulsion system engines um avionics um you know uh, helium tanks uh hydrazine tanks all of that um and so all of the all of the all the things that animate the stage and the 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 stage, one of the things that will happen with the Block 1 v vehicle is um, the, uh, the flight computers and the navigation unit will move up to the upper stage. So it'll be like more like a traditional rocket where the, uh, the upper stage has all of the, um, all of the smarts, basically. And then you have all of the slave boxes will still be distributed out through the vehicle. So um, the... <laughs> One of the things that happened that we just heard about um, in the past in the past month or so was a report from the uh, Government Accounting Office talking about some of the whipsawing that happened with the programs um, at the beginning of the year. Um, this had to do with the with the uh, lunar lander plans. Um, so in January, the SLS program and the Exploration Ground Systems program were told to start looking at the idea of launching two SLS vehicles almost simultaneously at the end of 2024, and uh, which would have required uh, quite a bit of expansion of the infrastructure um, at the Kennedy Space Center and also accelerating the development of this upper stage and then also the integrated upper stage with the core stage and the solid rocket boosters. Then relatively quickly after that, they were told, never mind. And so um, right now, the, the first flight of the EUS and the Block 1B vehicle would be, uh, that's planning on doing, uh, planning on being the crew vehicle, which would be the, the third one from the left. Uh, and that's planned for the fourth SLS launch now. Um, those plans could change um, again, um, depending on what happens with the lunar landing plans. Um, but as of right now, NASA is building um, three sets of Block One gear. So, the uh, the uh, ICPS upper stage, which is a Delta IV derivative, um, a the, the the stage adapter from the from the upper stage to the payload, um, and uh, so they will then build the 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 they'll they'll be building a set for uh, EUS, which has got an inner stage adapter, which is just a Eight, you know, 8.4 meter diameter uh, straight adapter um, to the core stage, and then there's a there's a uh, there are stage adapters for either a stage adapter for Orion, or then you get into payload attach fitting for a uh, a, a cargo payload. So, um, but we'll see where what exactly happens with the the SLS schedule. Um, the third and fourth flights are, there's still some question marks here because then the other thing that happened um, in that same time frame was the Europa Clipper critical design review. Um, and basically what happened is coincident with that, um, Congress passed the fiscal 21 appropriations and they, they, uh, they added language to the, uh, to the bill to give uh, NASA the uh, agency leadership a lot more latitude in what launch vehicle they were they want to use for that uh, for that probe to Jupiter. Um, prior to this, the, there were two mandates uh, for Europa, Europa Clipper. The first one was that it had to launch by uh, 2022, which is next year now, and the second one was that it had to fly an SLS. And so, the SLS program has been working on that, doing a design analysis on the vehicle, um, doing, uh, you saw some uh, wind tunnel testing that they're doing with, with, that, uh, with that configuration. But now with the latitude um, where they can choose what they wanna do with the, uh, with the uh, launch vehicle, the expectation is that uh, they will probably not use an SLS vehicle to launch and this is what the uh, these are the two choices for the the 2024 uh, launch opportunity that they're looking at. The one on the left is uh, the one that will be uh, the prime candidate 
would be to use a Falcon Heavy to launch the uh, to the launch the spacecraft, and I believe that those are the two vehicles that that JPL has been um, has been working with. Um, so, if uh, if they go with Falcon Heavy, it would be uh, they would launch in uh, the fall of 2024, um, and the, it would uh, it would uh, fly out towards Mars. It would do a Mars flyby um, shortly after launch. Uh, it would do an Earth flyby um, in late 2026, and then the spacecraft would get to Jupiter in uh, early 2030. And so then the alternative would be what they'd been planning before, which was just a, a, direct, uh, a direct launch with, uh, with the SLS Block 1 cargo vehicle. Um, that's still technically on the table. Uh, the, the two provisions that they talked about in the bill were, um, is there an SLS available? Um, but that's a judgment call. And then there's also um, coupled, load, uh, coupled loads analysis that, uh, that they were working on between the, the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. And um, they found some compatibility issues or discovered some, um, some issues that they needed to look into. And between the two of those, I, the, I think the way that the, the, the language was phrased, um, if either of those are not acceptable, uh, they, can, they can move to another launch vehicle. So uh, I think the expectation is that, that uh, they, will, uh, they won't find an available vehicle um, uh, at the very least. And so it's, it's at least a lot more likely that the spacecraft is going to fly, uh, is going to fly on um, something other than SLS, and that's really that's been the uh, that's been the position of uh, the agency leadership and the White House for a while now. So um, Congress has supported uh, flying the spacecraft on SLS for several years, um, but they're the ones that changed the language, and so they're they they're signaling that they're willing to do this, and so um, we'll just wait and see. Um, what the final decision is. What we were hearing was we might get a final decision here in the next couple of months. Um, and we'll have to see because there's also there's also one of the things in the appropriations bill was obviously the 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 uh, human landing system was not funded to the requested level. And so there's going to be a lot of discussions not just about um, how many providers to fund, but also the pace of development. And when they'll and whether they're going to be able to fly Artemis three with uh, in that twenty twenty four time frame. So isn't isn't part of the discussion to the modifications that need to happen to the mobile launcher to take SLS out of its crew configuration and into a um, and, and into the the science configuration even in the block one or or was that negated completely when the exploration upper stage was mixed for. Um, there would probably uh, was be. Next for I would assume that there would there would be some, and there there also. So when I was talking to uh, the, the 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 folks working on the flight software for the for SLS, there were some modifications that they were going to have to do. Um, I think that the the release that they're working on for the first flight for Artemis One is release fourteen of the flight software, and release fifteen was going to deal with. Um, with a cargo configuration for block one, um, along with mm -hmm. obviously Artemis two, you, you bring in human rating and you bring in some additional modifications. Um, for the, uh, for, the uh, for a block one cargo uh, vehicle, I guess the interesting thing with the, the con ops there would be, um, obviously you need to keep the uh, crew access arm out of the way. And, uh, um, but also um, handling the payload in the VAB, um, that's. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be curious to see, um, given it's a planetary uh, planetary probe, if they were going to do that, um, what type of protocols they would need to do. Because uh, I'm sure you'll remember, Chris, in the shuttle days, they didn't do a lot of payload operations in the VAB. So, no. um, <laughs> yeah, that was all done out of the pad. And so um, I'm sure that they've been working on this for a long time. So uh, they, I'm sure that they have plans to how to deal with that. But, of course, those might be short-circuited now. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's actually quite a bit going on right now in the program beyond Green Run, but obviously that's where everybody's focused right now. And so, hopefully, in the next week or so, we'll find out 
uh, which way they uh, which way they're going. Are they going to proceed into the hot fire, um, or are they going to, uh, um, or what are the what if if not what what was the alternative path that they uh, chose to pick? So. Um, Absolutely. And thank you, yeah. Philip. And I want to get into some questions about all of the different milestones that we just hit. And like I said, folks, Philip Sloss is the, or, is the SLS expert. If you can't tell, and if you didn't know, you know now. Uh, but uh, we've got a bunch of questions about a lot of the things that we were talking about. And I think the biggest one on everyone's mind is that green run schedule, because they've had these couple attempts. They haven't quite gotten it right. So they're we're waiting to hear if they can move on yet or not. What does these sort of decisions and whichever way they go implicate where that launch date might be because we know officially NASA has not given up on that November 2021 launch date for Artemis 1. We know that that seems, I okay, mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that seems unlikely and that it's likely already slipped into 2022. So what does where we are with Green Run tie into that conversation? Well, it's, it's, um, it is, it is the question. I'm not sure I have, uh, I'm not sure I have the answers. I have, I have, I have a lot of questions too. What, so let's say that they were, um, they've recycled the facility from a facility standpoint at Stennis in terms of getting the, uh, the barges, uh, re, you know, restocked with propellant and, and, uh, getting the, they've got a, they've got a facility, it's called the high pressure gas facility. Um, on the grounds there that have to deal with the, the vehicle, uh, the vehicle, they, they said it's uh, uh, almost a pig in terms of how much uh, gaseous nitrogen is used and helium is also used. Um, if they were ready to go into the hot fire in maybe the next couple of weeks, they might. And obviously, again, it's a success oriented schedule. They might be able to, to um, get the stage back on the, uh, on the Pegasus barge and get it to uh, Kennedy by sometime in February. And then that's really where the, the questions are. So um, in between the hot fire and, and uh, putting it back on the barge, they will need to do some refurbishment of the engines. Um, the entire engine refurbishment schedule, the way it was described to me, it's about a six week schedule and they've kind of cut it, they've divided it into pieces. So there's about three weeks of worth of work on the engines that they need to do in the stand at Stennis, and then they can finish up the rest of it in parallel with the launch processing and the stacking and um, all of the things that will be going on in the VIB. Um, they'll also need to take a look at the, the thermal protection system um, and see, uh, you know, just see how the vehicle and the thermal protection system handled eight minutes. It's not typically designed to sit still for eight minutes and fire. Um, and so the, the 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 test stand is actually going to be providing a lot of protection for the bottom of the vehicle. There's a whole bunch of acoustics that it has to deal with that it won't have to deal with during a, during a launch. Right. And then um, obviously there's also a thermal uh, a thermal uh, heat load on the vehicle that it also wouldn't see because it, it it will have accelerated out of the atmosphere. So if the vehicle were to get to the Kennedy uh, to Kennedy Space Center in February. Really, the big question is, how long does it take to finish the launch preparations um, at that point? And so that's really the question. Um, there's, uh, the, they can have the boosters stacked. Um, it's really just the, the, the main things that they need to do when they're at Kennedy are, um, obviously, they got to put the vehicle together. They have to do another uh, a, a modal test. Um, so what they'll do is they'll stack the entire launch vehicle, and then they're going to put a um, a, a simulated uh, a Ryan. It's also it's basically just a, a a large cylinder which simulates the weight and uh, center of gravity of the of the spacecraft, and then they're going to they they have to hook up all the instrumentation. Um, they will. Uh, They'll do this modal test, then they'll destack the, the 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 simulator and put on the Orion spacecraft at that point, and then they have to hook up all the umbilicals. They have to go through an entire integrated test sequence. Um, it's uh, called integrated test and checkout. Um, then they'll they'll roll the vehicle out to the pad. They'll do a a full launch vehicle wet dress rehearsal, and so um, that's <clears throat> they they have to. They have to also fuel the upper stage, and this will give them a chance to see how the pad systems work 
with the entire vehicle. So you not you don't just have the core stage that you have to fill, but you also have to fill the upper stage and you have to sequence that. Um, and then you also have to make sure that you can um, you can go through all the conditioning that you need to go through with for the stages um, in order to kind of get everything to uh, um, synchronized down to um, ignition. Um, and so they were talking about about a two week sequence for the wet dress rehearsal when they get out there, then they would they would uh, roll back to the VAB, do the final preparations, things like ordinance installations, um, final uh, installations in Orion, and then they'd roll out to the they'd roll back out to the pad, and that would be about a week's amount of time um, from the roll from the second rollout to the to the launch. But you know the thing that we're seeing with the green run is is this is the first time that they've ever done this, and so you know maybe the launch date stays in November for a while, but you know, we, I, I think it's it's reasonable to expect that you'll get this kind of uh, sort of nickel and dime delays um, when it gets to the Kennedy Space Center and they're gonna have issues like they've had, uh, uh, you know, with the core stage, um, which, you know. Which kind of brings up a, a question that I've got as well, but that's also a factor in this because, I mean, if we're, if we're talking about a, a 12 month stack limit on the solid rocket boosters, right? There's got to be, I mean, NASA, once they give that go-ahead to continue the stacking operation, which would start that 12-month clock, has to be fairly certain they're going to get it off the ground within, within 12 months, because if not, that's a, that's a huge, I mean, it's a safety consideration that you'd have to come back and, and, and recertify and de-stack the, the elements for the seals and the solid rocket boosters and we know why that's very important but that would be a huge public relations nightmare to to go through all of this and then well you stack your boosters too early so you got to come back you know so how, how much of that is also factoring into this i mean if we're, if we're sitting in january and talking about well november's a bit nebulous and nickel and dime changes here i mean Sitting in January with the first vehicle test flight in November, it's not unreasonable to expect this would end up in March or April of 2022, just based on new flight rules. So how, how much is that stack life weighing on this decision? And do we know if there's any wiggle room in there? Like, could they verify 13 months instead of 12 just to avoid the hassle of destacking the whole thing? They they were talking about that. So the, the what you said the the latter uh, part of that. So, uh, I I I'm, I'm you know Chris and I go back to shuttle days, and I I'm sure Chris will remember <laughs> that you know you have these you have these generic limits um, for for vehicles. So it's certified generically for twelve months, but then you know you can you can uh, you can do a more specific analysis, and they're they're looking at that as an option. And I think the fact that they they stopped and waited for the wet dress they're just basically trying to keep their uh, options open and give them as much um, operational flexibility as they can so then yeah. what i neglected to say was the if you looked at we haven't seen a flow chart of the of the integrated operations schedule um, for a while so there used to be an, a, an additional modal test in that sequence where they stack the vehicle, they were going to just they were going to do a modal test after they stack the core stage and the boosters. But the big picture thing is, and this is the, this is why we're not really sure where the launch falls out. Um, I guess the biggest point is once the core stage arrives at the Cape, we should get a much better idea at least where they think the launch is going to fall out on the calendar because. Mm -hmm. That integrated schedule is, was was not eleven months long. <laughs> I don't think right. it was even nine months long. So, you know, we you hear you hear this you hear this range of dates. Um, earlier, they we heard people talking about July, which is probably unrealistic, especially if the core stage doesn't get there till end of February, middle of February. You're only talking about what is that? Four months? Five months? That's that's not a long time for a first you know first flight vehicle, um, but they cut out they cut out that partial stack modal test and that was taking up I want to say about a month of schedule, so um, it's just we're just going to have I you know 
I would like to I would like to ask somebody about that, and I will if I get the chance um, to see you know how long is their schedule you know what does that schedule look like. Um, I don't know if they're holding any reserve time. Um, they used to be holding about a month's worth of reserve time. Um, so as an example, the, the booster stacking is supposed to only take about four weeks. They were also holding another four weeks in reserve to deal with contingencies. Um, um, and that's why they wanted to start now. So, uh, but, you know, again, the schedule's kind of fluid, but that's that's really going to be the thing, I think, is we just have to see when does the core stage get there? And then maybe they'll talk about, okay, here's sort of the baseline for uh, the, the operations, which are pretty much all gonna be in the VAB. Once they get to the, the wet dress, you know, you may still see, this is what I was talking about kind of with the nickel and dime stuff. You might find when you get to the integrated checkout or you get into the wet dress rehearsal, you, you're gonna, you might find some of the issues that they're finding here um, with you know, uh, launch commit criteria limits, things like that, that they have to tweak and they have to take a look at. Um, but I think when the core stage gets to Kennedy, which obviously is highly contingent on when they do the hot fire and then the outcome, um, that'll, that'll give us a better idea about, they should be able to give us a better idea about uh, at least kind of a target, a, a more reasonable target date than, you know, November plus or minus, Two months or three months, um, they should have a better. They should have more certainty, I think, about kind of a window of when uh, they'll be ready to launch. So as we get closer and as we get more milestones kind of checked off the list, and obviously that launch date becomes more and more firm. Uh, there's been a question here in chat about: Are there any room? Is there any room for steps between now and the launch to be cut out, especially if we're working up against? the booster seal uh, deadline that we're thinking about 12 months or so um, or anything like that. I mean, there's one question here is the actual hot fire test, which is the kind of culmination of the grid run. Is that something that should, you know, push come to shove and NASA really be up against schedule deadlines? Could that be cut out? Could they wet dress rehearsals that they've done so far, or maybe another wet dress rehearsal be enough? Is that hot fire uh, for sure required? I, yes, I, I mean, you know, it's not my call, but uh, considering, I mean, they just took they just took 12 months to do this. It would seem like it would seem an odd choice to do that to to make that choice now. And I think one of the things, um, one of the things about the hot fire that uh, you know, at least from what I've read online, I think everybody's thinking, you know, what the worst case, you know, a worst case would be. Well, um, they've talked a lot about well, we might not get the whole eight minutes in and that's fine when you're on the ground. So, I mean, you can have a safe shutdown in flight, but if you shut down four minutes into an eight minute burn in flight, that's, that's maybe not the worst day in the world, but it's pretty much, it's, you know, that's like game over, right. you know, and that can be, you know, there's no explosion there. You just, you just didn't make it to orbit. And I mean, in this case, they need that whole performance just about, I mean, Yes, they're reserving some um, performance. Uh, you know, they're they're reserving extra performance for this for this first flight. But uh, you know, if Orion doesn't make it all the way to the moon, or if it does a lunar flyby, that's probably you know, there it's going to require a lot of discussion. Now, they also you know, maybe the 2024 date is no longer uh, you know in play as much. We'll we'll right. see. I I don't think they've given up on that yet. So. Um, but that's the thing is this gives them the opportunity to test the vehicle. If they do get an early cutoff, uh, it's, you know, it's a mulligan there. They, you can, you can only fire for four minutes on the ground. Um, and they're also taking the opportunity to, to, uh, drive the systems a little bit. They're within, uh, um, within their limits, but they're going to, you know, they're going to be doing things with the engines that you would never see them do. Um, in a launch, I mean, you're basically mm -hmm. just trying to keep the vehicle pointed in the direction it's going and keep it from, you know, you don't want it to be moving around a lot, but they're going to be, you know, they're going to be driving the engines in opposite directions at like 10 degrees a second for, you know, and it'll look kind of funny if they let us look at it. I don't know if they're going to, but um, yeah, not the kind of stuff that you would do um, if you were actually trying to um, navigate to a cutoff, uh, a cutoff target. So. Um, 
there this is an opportunity that they that they're that that they they talked about giving up on for schedule and i think the fact that they chose to do it a couple of years ago i i i wouldn't expect them to um i wouldn't expect them to give up on it at this point um because it it is valuable and i guess if you think you know thinking long term they're not thinking um they're thinking about flying this vehicle for a long time so uh the, even if not everybody else is um, I think they're thinking long term, and this is this is a this is a uh, this is an opportunity that they're not necessarily going to get again. Um, so uh, I would be very surprised for them to to uh, to not uh, not at least not even try and start the engines um, in the test stand. I expect them to try, um, and then you know again it'll be it'll be like what we just saw with the wet dress. Um, so they. They wanted to count all the way down to 33 seconds. They didn't get all the way down there. They may still decide to go ahead and just go and 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 attempt the hot fire on their next tanking. Um, and so we may see the same thing with the hot fire. They'll fire the engines. Um, they may not get the entire eight minutes, and it'll just be a question of did they get enough data? Did they uh, did they meet enough of the test objectives to, um, you know, to proceed into launch preparations at that point point. and there's a there's a difference there though because when we're talking about wet dress rehearsal if they don't get all the way through a wet dress rehearsal when the next step's a hot fire test you have to do the wet dress rehearsal effectively before you do the hot fire you have to fuel the vehicle and do all of that plus you mentioned that there's plans for another wet dress rehearsal at the launch pad but uh, correct me if i'm wrong this hot fire test is the only one plan there's no shuttle style uh flight readiness firing happening at the kennedy space center correct that's correct. They can't. They can't really do a static fire on the pad for any period of time. Um, right. You know, you saw the same thing in shuttle where they they could run for about twenty seconds, which I think was I think they were talking about twenty seconds is about the amount of time it takes for the engines to kind of get uh, uh, thermally stable, mm -hmm. and uh, and so then that that's about all that the uh, the the flame trench there could handle. Um, so. Uh, I'm not even sure they could handle uh, uh, what they're going to do with uh, with w w in the stand at uh, at Stennis um, on the pad at uh, at Kennedy. So um, they probably could do you know a, a handful of seconds static fire, but you really wouldn't get the uh, you wouldn't get the data that that uh, that they're going to be able to get if they're able to fire for a significant amount of time in the stand at Stennis. Yeah, the other, the other big reason you wouldn't really want a static fire. Um, on, on the launch pad is you have two gigantic solid rocket boosters strapped to either side of you. And while a lot of, uh, and, and trust me, like a, a lot of effort goes into preventing accidental ignitions. But the thing to remember about this particular vehicle design is the engines are a lot closer to the solid rocket booster exhaust ports, which are sealed, but they are a lot closer to them. The, the dynamics are, are different and while they they know it's safe for the seven seconds that it takes the four engines to ignite and, and ramp up to full thrust and go through their checkouts before the solids will be lit um you know it's just an added risk when you're lighting things next to gigantic solid rocket boosters so um you probably wouldn't want to be doing that given their proximity um and that proximity is is, is very different from from the configuration of the shuttle program yeah i think the uh for this vehicle, I mean, I don't even know what the difference is for uh, shuttle, but the exit planes for these engines here that you're looking at on screen, the, the difference between the exit plane for the nozzles on the, the core stage and the exit plane for the nozzles on the solid rocket boosters is, I believe, 11 inches. Sorry to yeah. use uh, US <laughs> units, but it's it's about it's only about a foot difference. And so um, they yeah. actually had to uh, they had to actually add some um, thermal protection system to the to the engine, these engine bells that you're looking at, um, um, because they're so close to the solids, uh, um, which they weren't in shuttle. So yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's the, it, it, it this is a it's a valuable test the the green run, um, and I think that's why they kept it. Yeah. Uh, so you know we'll just have to see we'll have to see what happens. And I mean it is it is possible since they were only talking about two weeks i mean even if you account for christmas and new year's if they decided to do a hot fire attempt next um it might not be that far off in the future so you know maybe within, keeping maybe on the within topic the next of, couple of weeks uh, 
to be on the topic of engines here, I've got a question here about those RS-25s, of course, brought over from the shuttle program called Space Shuttle Main Engines. Now they're the RS-25. Have there been, what kind of changes have been made between the shuttle and the SLS programs? What kind of improvements have been made? They're really, the, especially the, the, the four engines that are on the core stage all flew during shuttle. Um, they're, uh, the, their, the major change is they changed the the engine control system. So it's uh, it, they have a completely new, relatively uh, relatively modern uh, engine controller unit, um, which is really uh, it's since you need the redundancy for these things, it's actually the engine controllers are actually two digital control units that are <laughs> back to back, um, you know, channel A, channel B, um, but it's a completely new. Uh, engine controller, um, and um, but aside from that, aside from things that you would change out like brackets and things from a time and cycle standpoint, um, they're basically the exact same engines that flew on shuttle. What they're doing now though is that they're running them at 109%, um, which they really didn't want to do very often in shuttle, um, except in you know low energy abort situations, which they really never had. Um, but when you do that, you're you're pushing you're you're pushing the the design closer to the limits. And you know we talk about reusable versus expendable. You can push these engines a little bit harder than you did in shuttle because you're you know when they shut off, that's their last that's their last firing. So, um, but really the engine the design's the same at, certainly for the first four engines. Um, and then they're they're. Uh, we just wrote a, a published a story about the uh, they're building new engines. This is an expendable vehicle. Um, they'll need to have four new engines for each core stage after the after the fourth vehicle. They'll run out of they'll run out of shuttle uh, main engines, uh, and um, those engines will uh, those engines will run at 111 um, percent. You can see in this chart here, um, you know you're going from you're going from um, Several dozen starts down to about four, um, and the idea is, you know, uh, most expendable vehicle engines, you you know, you do an acceptance test in the stand, and then you put it in the vehicle, and then you fire it once for flight. Um, so uh, there, the, the requirements, uh, the the form, fit, and function of the engine is pretty much the same. It's just it's it's being manufactured. And it's being run to different uh, uh, run to different uh, specs now, uh, but um, so it's higher performance. Um, it they don't the requirements are uh, more narrow, I guess you would say. Uh, they don't have to fire as many times. Um, they don't have to gimbal as hard. Um, so I think you're going from like a, a a ten degree gimbal range down to I think about it'll go down to eight degrees for the for these adaptation engines, which are basically the shuttle engines that they're going to consume. Then when you go to the, uh, when you start building new engines uh, that are going to run at 111%, they only have to gimbal, I think, in a six degree range. Um, so a lot of the flex, uh, a lot of the flex ducts that they're, uh, the articulating parts of the, of the ducting um, up at the top of the engine, when you're going from the inlets down into the turbo, into the high pressure turbo pumps, um, they don't have to articulate as much, and so you can uh, you can 3D print um, more of that, which is uh, obviously uh, uh, a more modern manufacturing method. Um, and so the idea is that they're basically they're just trying to make they're trying to make the engines um, cheaper to build in bulk because um, they're now uh, you know even though this vehicle only has a uh, they're the goal is to fly it once a year. That still means you need to be delivering engines every. Uh, you need to be delivering at least four engines a year, um, and uh, so um, the they're, the 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 testing. They're basically waiting for the core stage to to continue the testing on those new engines. Um, but it'll look it'll look about the same as the as the you know the the, the shuttle main engines. Um, a lot of this stuff was talked about back you know. Uh, a couple of decades ago, as um, you know, SSME had uh, block one upgrades and block two upgrades, which made it into uh, made it into flight. And then they were talking about a, a set of uh, block three upgrades, and a lot of those have um, been instituted now with the uh, with the um, 
production restart effort. But then they also now, and they, there's, they're talking about something uh, <laughs> called block four upgrades. And that would basically be where you're 3D printing the nozzle, which is a really high, uh, those are the, the two main pieces of the engine that are that, that take the longest to um, produce are the power head and the, and the nozzle. Um, and so uh, if they can, that would be the next evolution would be to do sort of monu uh, modern manufacturing of the power head and modern, uh, modern manufacturing of the nozzle. Right now you have, uh, those are obviously liquid cooled, uh, liquid hydrogen cooled nozzles to keep them from, you know, the, the, uh, the combustion temperatures are around 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And I apologize, I'm using English units. Um, but uh, those, there's 1,080 coolant tubes on the inside of the uh, engine nozzle. And those all have to be laid out in the engine, uh, in the engine nozzle. Um, and arranged, and then it goes into a big oven to, to fuse those to the the inside of the the you know what you're looking at the bell is called the is called a jacket, and uh, um, they uh, it's a very long process. And so one of the things they're thinking about doing is printing a nozzle that has the coolant tubes in the channel in the wall of the nozzle, and so that in theory that would it would take much less time to do and also be a lot uh, a lot less labor intensive um, to do that. Oh, I actually just showed my wallpaper there, foreshadowing of the next topic. But uh, <laughs> one, one final question here before we move on to that other super heavy, heavy lift rocket. Uh, we talked briefly about that Europa Clipper decision, which we're expecting hopefully before too long. And that's a big point in the SLS program. Will it launch the Europa Clipper mission or not? And we talked about Falcon Heavy being sort of the commercial uh, alternative should SLS not be ready. Are we expecting that to be just a plain and simple Falcon Heavy mission using the, I think it was like two two or three Earth gravity assists, or sorry, two, oh, I gotta pull up the actual thing because we have the slide for it. One Earth yeah. gravity assist and one Mars gravity assist, excuse me. Um, or are, were they still looking at kick stages? Because I know that was an idea at one point to put a third stage, a kick stage as part of the payload in the payload fairing, and that could get them close to a more direct flight profile. Uh, where are we in that decision? The, well, uh, it would be, you know, it, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to a launch services program at some point about um, all of this. But the short answer is that Falcon Heavy has the performance. I'm not sure exactly whether it's whether you're doing an expendable, uh, you know, uh, doing an expendable vehicle versus a, re, you know, fully recoverable vehicle. But it has the performance to do this Mars Earth gravity assist uh, trajectory um, without a kick stage. So, um, it uh, I'm not. It, that's the question: is where or you know where is that performance coming from? But it does have the performance to do that without a kick stage. And so, um, I think somebody was saying, you know, you also have they're talking about torsional loads and the appropriations bill language, which is an interesting thing um, to be engineering language in an appropriations bill, but um, you have, you would also have low, you know, loads if you put a kick stage underneath the uh, Europa Clipper that they may not want to, it would mm -hmm. be, it would be advantageous for them to just be able to, uh, you know, just to be able to go out there without, uh, without the kick stage. And I'm pretty sure that Falcon Heavy can do that. So the only other thing to mention there is obviously um, Congress, which you have all the, you know, disparate, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, represent, you know, representations, they put language in there that said, if it's not going to fly in SLS, then you have to do a full and open competition, and you have to open right. up out past the uh, the the NLS two certified vehicles, which is Falcon Heavy is the I believe the only one in that within that subset, and I think it's the only one that 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 uh, the uh, your Clipper project is looking at besides SLS. But having said that, uh, you know I I I would be surprised. Um, I would be surprised if they can. I, I'm not sure that uh, you know the other vehicles can do uh, the the Mars Earth gravity assist trajectory. Um, so 
but you know I we'll mean, see your equivalents would have to be what new glenn and vulcan if you're expanding past the already certified vehicles those would be the only other two in off the top of your head unless right or could they go international area six maybe that i don't know i would assume that if they're talking about if they mentioned nls2 and there's an nls3 of course at some point as well but i would assume that they would want to launch this on a on a uh a u.s launcher um mm -hmm. so uh but yeah because you know, I, I know the question people are probably going is oh but wait the james webb space telescope is a nasa project that's going on the right. area and five well james webb is actually a nasa european space agency canadian space agency partnership and the launch vehicle of area five is part of europe's contribution financial contribution to the to the project which is why it can get around those sort of why is it going on an international vehicle if it's a U.S. mission? Because it's not a purely U.S. one. Versus Europa Clipper, which is... Are, are there international partners on the Europa Clipper? I believe we have... I think there are some, like, in, in, the, in the scientific field, um, but it's a primarily a NASA mission. Gotcha. But the, the, the only other thing that I think would, would factor into the upper stage element... Um, and it, it's a spitball question off the top of my head: Is how how tall is Europa Clipper in its configure in its folded configuration? Because the Falcon Heavy payload might not be <laughs> as tall. Well, yes, but that's the estimate. so. My point right. is the the you have to it, the Falcon Nine payload turn is wide enough and and tall enough for it. But if you stick a Star Forty Eight or a Caster Thirty solid pop stage underneath that, it might not meet the um, it might not meet your standard payload configurations for the Falcon Heavy, which means, or for the Falcon Heavy, which means it might require that extended payload fairing if you wanted the optional stage on there. Again, that's a spitball question, but but it's part of the um, but it's part of the the, the overall question, right? Because a five meter class payload fairing is five meters wide, um, but then you can have various lengths of, of those depending on vehicle aerodynamics and how tall. Of spacecrafts you want to accommodate, like we see with the Delta IV heavy line of vehicles, which have different length payload bearings as well. Right, and this uh, for for the SLS option they were using. Um, so the the Block One vehicle is using a, a slightly stretched version of the Delta IV heavy upper stage. Um, if they for the SLS option, it's you know it's basically using the whole Delta payload package. So you've got mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's the it's the 14 meter long uh, um, Delta five meter approximately five meter <laughs> in diameter um, fairing um, versus the 19 meter long. Uh, and I think in this this uh, graphic here is showing the correct scale um, because that was one of the choices that they made early on was because it relatively uh, uh, this was at the edge of the SLS Block One capability to do the, these uh, a Jupiter Direct has a C3 uh, in the 80s um, uh, somewhere sort of low 80s to mid 80s depending on which opportunity you go to. And so they they it was it was uh, close enough in performance that they didn't want to use the 19 meter long fairing um, versus the 14 meter long fairing. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's it fits in a it fits it typically fits in a five meter you know five meter payload fairing envelope. And I you were talking about that, Chris. That those uh, the the um, the uh, the um, NRO contract that uh, the the an NSSL uh, uh, two contract that SpaceX just won. I I assume that 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 fairing that they're going to have available for those payloads would be would would accommodate this uh, mm -hmm. if if it does if their standard fairing does not. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much. And I want to pivot over to some more SpaceX stuff because we have that other super heavy lift rocket, which is going to be right alongside SLS. And I know there's a lot of discussion and comparison between the two. Uh, actually, I'm just going to pull up this video to start with just happening today. The Starship SN10 nose cone being stacked in the high bay. This is the latest milestone. Literally just happened right before the show. Uh, the So... In addition to Starship SN9, which is already at the launch site, we have Starship SN10 now being stacked into the high bay. And so we're going to go into some questions and some updates. Uh, but before we do that, we have 
tons of super chats that have come through during the SLS sort of discussion. So I want to get to these really quickly. Uh, John with a super chat. Thank you so much for your support. And I'm going to hold on. I got to pull up my cue. So it actually shows up. There it goes on screen. Thank you for your support. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we've got a question here from Rough Rider Show. A really quick answers from the two of you. Which launch are you most most looking forward to in 2021? Philip, you first. Well, I, I I would think it should be obvious. Um, I've, been, <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been, yeah, I've been covering this for a while, so it would be kind of nice if, if if they launched this year. I I have a feeling there are several people who feel that way. Maybe not quite as many as uh, for uh, for uh, Starship, but yeah, I kind of like to see that. Chris, uh, launch I am most looking forward to this year is the James Webb Space Telescope. Right, I think that would be my answer. Um, although. If SLS launches in 2021, I would yield and say that I am even more looking forward to that, but I'm a little pessimistic on that end. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Rough Riders, thank you for the super chat and for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, Ted with a new membership. Thank you so much for joining on. Hope you enjoy. Uh, Future Martian, a regular in the stream, and now also a writer for NASA Space Flight. Published his first article not too long ago. Thank you so much for your support. The Super Chat here's to a hopefully amazing 2021. Also, Thomas Fan Club. I don't know where the Thomas Fan Club thing starts, but I appreciate all of you. I appreciate it. Uh, another super chat here from Kelly Williams. Happy New Year, NSF team. Looking forward to many more exciting launches and Starship tests with you all in 2021. Thank you so much for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, Cameron Fry with the new membership. Thank you so much. And uh, Germano, thank you as well for joining on. And I think that catches us up on the super chat and membership front. Again, can't do any of these streams without all of your all support. So we appreciate it. Uh, but let's go back into some Starship updates. And of course, we did nice. just see. Starship SN10 has been stacked. The other uh, subject or the other uh, topic of focus for Starship is, of course, SN9, which is already at the launch site. Chris G, what are you looking forward to in the next week or so as far as Starship goes? Oh, boy, in the next week or so? Oh, man, this thing might have flown by then. Um, I know. <laughs> that, was, that was the hint, Chris. That, that was the hint. Yes. Um, so the the so we, we know there is a they're they're getting ready for the static fire test of fire adapters. We have uh, road closure notices uh, indicating that that could happen as early as Monday um, at Boca Chica. Um, and after that, it's really a question of how well the static fire test goes. If static fire goes well, which there would be, you know, good reason to assume it would go well. But these are also fairly new engines and new designs. There are always things that crop up. Um, that wouldn't be totally unexpected. But if it goes pretty well, SN9 could fly this week. Um, and that is a distinct possibility. Um, again, a lot of it will, will be predicated on that static fire of the Raptors, but it, we, we could be seeing, um, we're seeing some good progress here. And I think the big tell is the stacking, and I'm glad we began with it, because uh, that's where I wanted to begin with it, was the stacking of SN10. Um, because the fact that they have that stack indicates that they are lining these things up to go in the rapid fire order that they had originally anticipated SN9 following um, SN8, uh, which flew in early December. SN9 was going to fly very quickly thereafter, but then had a fainting spell, tipped over in the high bay. Um, you know, it saw SN8 crash and went, oh, uh, <laughs> um, it had to be revived. But um, uh, we, we do see that type of cadence and work at the production facility matching what was happening prior to SN8. So uh, it's entirely possible that 9 will go this week and 10 will follow very, very quickly. Of course, you can see the wreckage of uh, SN8 there um, in the foreground. But uh, yeah, so this is really going to be a, a week of testing and prepping for that flight. Uh, we do not know the, the firm date yet um, for when that will happen, um, but we do know that they're going, to fly, uh, they're going to fly basically the identical profile that SN8 did. Um, and they're going to, just this time, uh, they, they've focused a lot. They've made tweaks to various parts of the vehicle, but the biggest area has been um, the liquid methane header tank, um, which depressurized during the landing, during the flip and burn. Um, which I'm just happy that something from the expanse can now be said in real life uh, <laughs> for Starship, the flip and burn. Um, 
But uh, we know it was the uh, liquid methane tank that depressurized during that flip and burn on SN8. And you can see the exchange between uh, Tim, Everyday Astronaut, and Elon here, um, where Elon said that uh, for SN9, they're simply going to press pressurize the header tank with helium. Um, and they're still trying to figure out what the longer term solution is for that. But they appear to have converged on a solution here. Um, which does give away a few things, right? We've been talking on the streams a lot about the, that failure mechanism, right? And that all we knew was that it was a methane tank depressurization. And we, we were saying, like, it could just be that it depressurized, right? And there's a simple fix to it. Or it could be, you know, maybe struts gave loose, maybe some of the connectors gave way as it was doing the flip and burn and all of those G-forces that are acting on the vehicle at the time. But this really does indicate from Elon it was a simple depressurization issue that they seem to have found a solution to, which would rule out larger issues that could have cropped up with the vehicle doing that maneuver, which is impressive that, you know, that, that maneuver um, and that vehicle survived it. So it's going to be really interesting uh, to see. But, but that, that was really the biggest um, thing that we, that we saw. Um, this past week has really been um, a, a fairly standard flow for a Starship. It underwent its cryogenic pressure, uh, cryogenic tanking tests earlier this week. It underwent um, ambient tension, uh, ambient pressurization checks um, to make sure its tanks could survive. Um, everything like that. It really, really has gone very smoothly for SN9 since they've hauled it out to the launch pad after writing it there. So there, there's a lot. This week, there's a lot to cover, but I kind of feel like there are probably some really good guiding questions um, that we could use here um, as I well, because I know what because... people really want to talk about yeah, and is so how I mean, that so booster I, is so going to be caught. I put this caught. tweet yeah. on screen <laughs> because, you know, wraps up the, uh, the SN9 changes from SN8 discussion, but I'm just going to scroll up a little bit because this is the other <laughs> Elon tweet that we need to address uh, today. <laughs> We're going, I quote, we're going to try to catch the super heavy booster with the launch tower arm using the grid fins to take the load. All right, let's back up for a second. So <laughs> this is the big bombshell that Elon put on Twitter today, or not today, a couple of days ago, this week, because they want to get rid of the landing legs. I know the landing legs have been an issue that have been in Starship development. They're trying to work out what's the best way to do this. Can't get away with no legs on a Starship vehicle. Starship needs to land where there's no launch infrastructure, things like that. And we know they're still working on what the best leg design for Starship will be. But for the Super Heavy Booster, that's only flying here on Earth. It's only used to get to orbit from Earth. You don't need it on planets with lower gravity. So they're trying to get rid of the legs completely. So we're not going to deal with landing leg design problems. We're just going to catch it in midair during landing. Chris, yeah. initial thoughts on that <laughs> idea. So I, I, I admit when I first saw this, my brain made it far more anthropomorphic than it probably <laughs> would be because I just envisioned human arms reaching out and gently grabbing it as it descends toward the... Okay, so all, all joking aside, all, all weirdness for how this is going to work aside, this actually solves a very critical issue right. uh, and question we've had for um, for the rapidness of the reuse. Because if this thing landed on legs on a landing pad, even if the landing pad was right by the launch tower, which was the original um, design idea, right? And then a crane would swing around and pick it up, the legs would be attracted, and it would spin it around and put it back on the launch cradle. But that's a lot of time. That's, a, that's, that's added complexity that if you can design a system of arms that can catch your booster, you can eliminate a lot of that complexity, All right? And, and this matches very nicely with what Elon has said, right? You, you design for what you think you need, and then you look for ways to de-engineer the vehicle. Right. Uh, the best engineering is the simplest engineering, right? Or the best engineering is no engineering at all, something like that. There's some yeah. weird phrase like that, but, um, but it, it, it really does follow. And because if you can catch this thing with arms using the grid fins to take the load, right? Using the grid fins to take the load basically just comes down in like that. Then you can just swing it over and put it right on your launch mount. And this does a couple of things. It can protect the launch mount um, from direct plume impingement of a booster coming back down, right? Um, the booster doesn't then have to be in perfect orientation as it touches down on the launch pedestal, because this was something that had baffled me for a long time. If you can get it to land on the launch stand, what if it's not aligned correctly for your, um, for your umbilicals, right? To load propellant and everything like that, right? What if there's a millimeter 
mismatch on that, right? Suddenly your whole thing is blown. This solves that issue. Now, there's quite a bit of complexity to this because you've got to have a guidance system and a flight stability system that can bring this booster down in such a way that, it, that it's either coming down between the two posts that are going to close in and try to catch it, or, but, but no, no, no matter what, that, that is just it's such tight clearances, which if you think about it, they've been proving time and time and time again, they can hit those dead center targets on drone ships and on landing pads, right? If the winds are in their favor. So really to me, th this isn't so much a question of how it's gonna do it. You know, there, there might be like the video we're showing now, a little bit of a side of, of, of a horizontal translation there. Most of it will be a vertical, a vertical drop like the Falcon 9s do. But there are a couple of ways that, that, that you could do this. And, and of course, one of the things that you can do that I think a lot of people, myself included, when I first heard this, it didn't make sense to me because the Falcon 9s don't achieve that really slow touchdown speed until they're basically on the ground. Right. But with the deep, deep, deep throttle capability that you can do with the Raptors, you can basically get this thing to hover at a certain point with throttle control and kind of bounce it and translate it over horizontally if you need it, like this video is showing. So do you Maybe think that's what they're going to do? To do you do think it. they're going to hover it or I... is it going to be closer to the hover slam? Because we got a question asking about this and there's been some, It's. I mean, there's some question about how many Raptor engines are you going to land with? How deep yeah. can they throttle? So what do you think? I, 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 I don't think it's going to be quite like the video that we're seeing here. I think there are a lot of, I, I think there are way too many wires and, and things that could get in the way of that. But I think the basic idea of what you're seeing is would 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 be the best strategy and probably the one they're looking at, right? Some something that protrudes out from the tower. I don't think it would hang out from the tower, but something that protrudes out from the tower that you can get the booster close enough to then either do a little horizontal motion into it, into the cradle to actually catch it, or the cradle arms kind of close around it once the system realizes that the bottom of the booster and the engines have passed it. So if you kind of think about it, like little little legs like this, that once the booster comes down into the middle would whoop, kind of, you know, hook in to grab the grid fins. Um, that would be that would be my guess um, as, as a starting point. But again, what that's going to look like in the end, I don't know. And they don't either, right? They're, they're, right. they're, they're testing this and, and that's amazing. But it does solve a really fundamental problem of that rapid reusability and repositioning over the launch mount. So Bit of a surprise, but I think once the initial shock of what rockets don't land like that, rockets need wide open spaces with no towers to land, right? When once you get over the thought process of well, that's not how we've done it before, right? And it, like so many things with SpaceX, it ends up making perfect sense, right? Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn our focus from the future endeavors of the super heavy testing. Of course, that is a big milestone that is going to hopefully take place this year. It, Ilana said within a couple months, we will have that first hop test of a super heavy booster. That'll be a big milestone. And then of course, you know, will Starship get to orbit this year? I don't know about that, but it's possible. Um, regardless, the immediate milestone that we're all looking forward to is that SM9 test flight, which could happen as soon as next week, pending how uh, when that static fire actually occurs. So let's talk a little bit about that. And we've got some questions. So let's see what chat wants to know. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a good one. Do they need to move the big crane from the launch site prior to SN9 static fire? And are they going straight into that? Or will they do a wet dress rehearsal first? Um, so what we do know is that they've already completed ambient temperature testing and cryogenic temperature testing um, with not with propellants, but with inert nitrogen. And so the question is, will they go into a wet dress rehearsal or just a static fire? Um, and we kind of actually touched on this in the SLS segment because mm -hmm. all a wet dress rehearsal is, is counting down and then stopping before you light the engines. So during a static fire flow, you kind of complete a wet dress rehearsal. And it's just a matter of if something goes up or comes up during that wet dress rehearsal, during the countdown, you can stop and abort and not do the engine firing. Um, but if everything goes well, you are positioned and ready for an actual static fire test. So you can kind of roll both milestones into one. And so I suspect that they, during that first fueling attempt, and again, we'll know for sure once Mary and the other locals get that uh, hazard notice that 
uh, an overpressure event risk is present because of an engine firing test. Um, once we have that uh, given up, we'll know they're going towards a static fire. And I suspect that first time that they do actual propellant load on SN9, it'll be a static fire attempt. Chris, do you agree? I, I, I would agree with that. Um, because like you said, like any, anytime you start to load propellant into a vehicle, it's automatically a wet dress rehearsal unless right. you, or, or until you light your engines. And even once you light the engines, it's technically a static fire until the clamps release and you lift off. Um, That's true. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think with the maturity that we've seen in the design, especially last year, right? And and last year was was incredible, right? I mean, we went through SN1, we went from SN1 to SN8 flying and almost nailing the landing in one calendar year. The, the, all of that that they gained, you know, wet dress rehearsals are good. And, and, and can help you in some ways, but um, at, at a certain point, as your system matures, like you were saying, Thomas, you just go for the static fire because at the end of the day, if you end up with a wet dress rehearsal, you still learn something. Right. Let's see, more questions here. Um, here is one talking about the booster and the spacecraft itself. How can a super heavy booster hold 27 Raptor engines when in SN8, the Starship vehicle, there is already barely the place for eight to 10 of them. So we know operationally, ah. the Starship vehicle should have six Raptor engines, three sea level and three vacuum, mm -hmm. subject to change based on different variants and things like that. Um, but that the Starship vehicle is the same diameter as the super heavy booster. So Chris, how are they gonna fit 27 Raptor engines in there? Yeah, so here's you can fit 27 sea level thruster raptors in there, right. which are the ones that we saw the third, the cluster of three that we saw flying SN SN8 are the sea level raptors. Uh, so you can fit 20, you can fit more. Uh, wasn't it 33? Yeah, max? so the, the 31 or 33 max and initially and they it'll be a little bit less. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Something like that. Right. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can do that. But once you once you get to sea level raptors um, with the larger uh, with the larger exit nozzles and everything optimized for vacuum, you can fit six. Um, the other way they can get twenty seven into the super heavy is that not all twenty seven of them gimbal. Um, so you can pack the ones that don't gimbal much tighter together because all you have to account for really is the the startup trans the startup and shutdown transients of the engines, how much the engine bell flexes um, as the engines are next to each other. You just want to make sure they're outside the limits of being able to hit one another um, when that happens. All right, continue on with more questions. Uh, talking about Starship SN9, do you think SN9 will fall to the same fate as SN8 or win the battle against the methane header tank? So as far as we know, that header tank was the only issue that really came up during SN8's test flight. We are expecting SN9 to follow the same flight profile, except try to nail the landing. Since it's so early, I think it's reasonable to say that there's a risk that a new issue could come up that didn't come up during the first mm -hmm. test flight. Again, only one flight's worth of data. Um, but should uh, SN8's flight prove to verify the rest of the system and that that fix for the methane header tank is actually successful, fair chance that SN9 does actually make the landing. 100%. So, um, right. I think the biggest risk now, aside from some unknown issue that you're only going to discover in flight, right, like the methane header tank problem, um, would, would be how much the vehicle is still translating horizontally at touchdown. Um, there was a very interesting thing you could see on the video where when Starship did the flip and the, the flip and burn there at the end, it was coming in horizontally, which, which would match the, the flight profile, right? But it was coming in at a bit of a horizontal angle down toward its landing pad. So I think that's the biggest question now is, is the horizontal velocity and energy at touchdown, if they can nail the flip and burn, do the landing legs buckle because it's a little bit, it's moving a little bit too much. That, that would be my area of biggest concern um, aside from something that completely unknown that might get them in a new vehicle. But like we mentioned, you know, even if the Starship SN9 flight is not 100% successful, if they get farther than SN8 did, that's a huge success. And they've got <laughs> SN10 right behind it. So leading into this next question, and I want to bring in back some of that SLS discussion because it's relevant. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this rapid production and testing cadence with the Starship vehicle and with an ambitious goal of potentially getting to orbit this year. 
which we're talking about, you know, and both SLS and Starship are kind of on track to make their first launch attempts near the end of this year, whether that's late 2021 or early 2022. So how does that uh, kind of fit into their overall architectures? We've got both vehicles are integral parts of the Artemis program now. And we should mention that sometime this month, we're expecting NASA to make that down select decision on the human landing system. Which... I believe it's February. Is it February now? It's uh, the last time I talked in with them in October. They were five months into the ten month contract, and they said February was the oh, okay. decision point. All right. So I think they had, they revealed in April, and it was a ten. They awarded the contracts in April, and it was a ten month contract. So yeah, February is when they'll down select. Okay, I apologize. So February, early 2021 is the point. Uh, we will hopefully soon find out which of the three HLS designs will proceed towards test flights, one of which is Starship. Starship has potentially a leg up on the others in the fact that they have flown prototypes on suborbital missions, atmospheric missions at least. So there is, but of course, there's other things that we don't know about the other competitors as well. Regardless, potential for Starship to move forward as an integral part of the Artemis program. Of course, SLS is right there with it. So. Th in the initial, or at least the current plans for the Artemis program, Starship and SLS will be right alongside one another, working together to accomplish Artemis missions. Looking down the road a little bit, and I want to get Philip's opinion on this, when Starship initially moves past the launching an uncrewed HLS configuration, again, assuming it's selected, and being used solely as the lunar lander, not launching humans from Earth on board, to the point where SpaceX is able to confidently human rate the super heavy vehicle and Starship vehicle to launch crew from Earth on Starship itself. Do you see SLS having a role to play in further down the road deep space missions uh, as far as a sort of Artemis lunar architecture goes? I mean, it it depends on, I think it depends, well, there's a lot of things it depends on, but I think, you know, <laughs> obviously one of the you know one of the big criticisms of sls is the price tag and so you know we talk about um uh, you know for for commercial crew you talk about having two separate uh spacecraft that are completely independent of one another so you could make the argument well it's nice to have it's nice to have two separate super heavy lift vehicles um supporting your program that's one argument the other argument is you know that's a lot of money and right. um so you know that's gonna be you know that'll be a choice that that'll have to be made you know that's i mean i i think obviously you also have um you know the main supporter of of the of sls is congress um we've seen a uh I, I trying to keep politics out of it but i think it's worth pointing out that you have diametrically opposed from a philosophical standpoint, White Houses between uh, President Obama and President Trump, they really ended up pretty much in the same position <laughs> on <laughs> SLS, which was, uh, you know, they, they're emphasizing commercial, uh, commercial launch vehicles. And, uh, you know, you, we saw this, we saw the Trump White House oppose continuing development of the exploration upper stage and ba basically it, the way i interpret that is they wanted to complete sls development now more or less so you have this vehicle that's going to fly crew and they wanted to just um finish that and then just fly it as a crew transport you know a, a crew mm -hmm. transporter and only fly orion flights to the gateway essentially um so you know obviously congress completely disagrees with that but you know we'll have to see what happens um you know the it'll depend i think in part on when uh starship and super heavy come online and also when sls comes online and and mm -hmm. um sort of how the the capabilities and when they uh, are available come online for both vehicles and so but yeah i i think the elephant in the room is the price tag um like, do you, how much do you want to spend to have a, you know, to, to continue to, you know, to do this? You know, that's, you know, I don't think anybody here gets to actually answer that question. It's, <laughs> it's Congress that's going to, you know, they may decide that they want to continue. Um, I'd say at least the, with the current makeup, they probably would continue to support SLS 
as a second super heavy launcher. Um, so, but you know, <laughs> things change, and we'll find out. Mm -hmm. I think probably in the next five years, I think we'll you know we'll we'll see things will change. <laughs> they certainly have in the last five years. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that they have, including the vehicle that's on screen right now. Um, yes, right. Yeah. Um, I think I think to the to the to the bigger to, to the first part of the question, which is the down select. I, I I don't see a way that Starship and the national team are not the two that are selected to go forward. Um, I have a hard time personally. Um, oh God, I can't even remember their name right now. Um, not Draper. Um, Dynetics. The Dynetics. The Dynetics. Yes, thank you. The Dynetics lander. I don't really see a way that that one continues forward. I, but then again, you know, all we have is their PR video. They've been very, very tight-lipped about where they are in the process. But but I just have a hard time seeing the national teams, Lunar Lander with Blue Origin, Lockheed, and North of Grumman, and then Starship from SpaceX, not or Moonship, whatever they're calling it, um, uh, not being the two that are selected to move forward. I, I think I think from NASA's perspective, the national team lander is the safer bet for 2024. I don't think it's a completely safe bet, but I think it's the safer one when you're talking about taxpayer money purchasing a service for something right out of the gate. Um, but I, but you know, NASA. There's been a huge paradigm shift within NASA's leadership regarding space and regarding the commercial entities and markets, right? And the thing to remember is Jim Bridenstine. And I mean, this might have been one of the most historic things he said during his um, during his administration and leadership of NASA was, "If Starship works, it's a game changer." And we can't afford not to be a part of it from the beginning. So I don't see a way it's not selected for this. Um, and the other thing that I'll, re that, that I'll say I, that I kind of arrived at after the election here in the US was done and, and we knew who won it, um, you know, the Artemis program is not going away. The, the, the Artemis program will survive no matter what political upheaval occurs in, in all of the nations that are supporting it and, and that are a part of it. The program isn't going away. The goal of lunar um, settlement and scientific research goals is not going away. It's just the bigger question of what's the rocket that's going to be launching the people to it. And in that regard, I don't see a potential bright future for SLS because, it, it, and I know Chris, Chris Bergen has said a lot about this, because as soon as Starship can demonstrate on-orbit refueling, that's it. Right. I mean, that's that's it. At that point, it can take far more than SLS can to any point in the solar system. Um, so I think it's one of those things where if I was a betting man, SLS would stay around until Starship can prove to NASA that it can do everything that uh, that um, that SLS can, or until New Glenn arrives as well. I mm. think I think it's the combination of Starship and New Glenn that will put an end to, to SLS from the price tag perspective, because I think it's going to eventually become untenable and unjustifiable from a how much we are spending on it for one launch a year when Starship and New Glenn could be launching many, many more times than that for much cheaper. And you should mention, you mentioned any point in the solar system, NASA isn't only looking at the moon, they're also looking at Mars. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that Starship is a much more Mars-centric design. It's just the fact that, oh, yeah, we can also use it for the moon. But that it was designed right. as a Mars vehicle. And if NASA wants to pursue past the moon in the not-too-distant future, like you said, they can't afford to not be involved in Starship development because that's the vehicle that's going to be able to you know, enable that. Well, and when you look at it, you know, we, we, we like to say, right, that payloads right now are launch vehicle agnostic. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the wonderful thing about Starship is it's, it's location agnostic. It's the same sure. design, whether you want to send it to Neptune or Mercury or any of the places in between. It's the same. You just tweak the payload that's on it, you know. Exactly. Got some more super tests that have come through here. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the same, but I'll try Odilon, o Odilon, something like that. Thank you so much. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong, but thank you for the new membership. We appreciate it. Uh, Michael with a super chat. Thank you so much. 
Uh, also got some super chat messages here. One from John saying, personally, I'm excited for anything going up. Thanks for all the info. <laughs> I think we can agree with that sentiment. Anything that's launching, we can get excited for it. Thank you so much. Uh, super chat here from Thomas. Cool name, Thomas. If BN1 is booster number one, say it's the reason that SN9 is actually Starship number nine instead of serial number nine. Listen, we could have an entire episode about SpaceX naming conventions, and it would be really boring, but it'd be really controversial. So maybe we don't get into that discussion, but potentially you've got a point. Thank you for your super chat. And uh, Matt Hill with a happy New Year's to the NSF team. Hope you'll have a great broadcasting year. Well, thank you so much for the super chat. We appreciate it. And uh, I want to end it off. We are coming up towards the end of the show right now, but we've got one more question. That I think I'll wrap this up nicely. Uh, Micah with the question, happy new year. What are you winning? What are you wanting? I'm sorry. What are you waiting the most about this year? Or is it too early? Keep up the good work. So I guess we talked about our, our favorite launches of 2021 already. Uh, what are you looking forward to covering and uh, writing about in 2021? Uh, maybe that's not a launch. Uh, Chris, you first. Oh. Um. Oh, why do you give these to me first when I have <laughs> right, to Phillip, think about you go them? first. Um, <laughs> Well, I guess, it, you know, uh, I, I'm interested in the whole thing, the whole, you know, I just like I'm sure you guys are with 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 what SpaceX is doing, um, you know, I, I obviously we'll keep hearkening back to the shuttle, um, you know, they would fly, you know, four to six times a year. But I mean, you know, for 45 to 50 weeks out of the 52 weeks of the year, they're doing something else. And so. One of the I was always interested in what that other what that other thing was. It's a whole bunch of other things. So, I mean, you've got um, they're building more core stages in in New Orleans. Um, they're they're built. They're going to start building upper stages. Um, you know, it would be interesting to it would be interesting to get to know Orion a little bit better. And um, you know, and also obviously it will be interesting to see them start to put together this first uh, SLS vehicle at the Cape. I don't know how much we're going to get to see, uh, obviously due to the virus, um, in person. But um, yeah, there's you know planning for future missions, analyzing you know this next mission. There's flight design, there's production, there's um, all sorts of, uh, of things. And so I'm you know I'm basically just carrying this forward from 2020 to 2021. Um, yeah. The thing I'm so that isn't a launch. Well, it is a launch, but bear with me because it's a sequence of them. Um, the I, I think the thing aside from Europa Clippers individual launch that I'm most looking forward to covering and writing about this year is the start of assembly of the Chinese space station. Mm. That's been a long time coming, um, and, and 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 well deserved for them as well, um, since they're banned from being part of the International Space Station because of U.S. politics. So. Very happy to see them pressing forward with their own space station. That will hopefully not just be for China too, but maybe Russia could visit it, maybe some other, I mean, they would have to launch from either Kazakhstan, Kostochny, or um, or Zhuquan. Um, but uh, it would be nice to see not just a Chinese space station, but some international cooperation there as well. Yeah, I think overall, I'm going to point my attention this year to sort of the overall Artemis program. I'll admit that the first thing that's going to catch my is that Perseverance landing in February. I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, but uh, overall, throughout the year, I mean, HLS development, SLS development, Starship development, all of those things are going to tie into some very exciting times in the not too distant future, getting Gateway ready to launch and just all of the uh, progress we can make towards Artemis getting humans to the moon and on to Mars afterwards, I think I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to that and hopefully writing about it a lot for NASA spaceflight as well. Um, Indeed. So, but that, uh, that, that's a good point you just brought up, Thomas, that I, this is a good one to end on a note of hope, that we're a month away from the Mars fleet beginning to arrive. Yes. That is awesome. Yes. Absolutely. So that is going to do it for the first episode of NASA Spaceflight Live for 2021. I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who sends their support to these streams, including all of our YouTube members. For those of you who join on, you get a lot of very cool perks. And without you guys' support, we could not do it without you. So thank you so much, especially to the top uh, contributors there on the screen. 
thank you so much for your continued support and thanks for sticking with us. Uh, another huge thank you to everyone who sends in super chats and just tunes into these streams. Anyone who clicks subscribe, we really do appreciate all of that support and we're thankful that you come to hang out with us on NSF Lives and for live events such as Starship Tests and uh, launch days. Uh, of course, stay tuned because we've got Starship Testing coming up next week. Again, Static Fire is as early as Monday. Stay tuned for that. We'll also stay tuned for more daily videos from Boca Chica via Mary Boca Chica Gal. A huge thank you to her for all of the content you saw on the show today, um, as well as plenty of other content from around the spacefly world. But Philip, thank you for coming back to the NSF live team for some more coverage. Thank you for joining us. And Chris G as well, a familiar face. Uh, thank you for coming on to the show as well. That's going to do course, it for man. today. And uh, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time. Pressure looks good. Tall enough. Roger, 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 roger. 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 Roger, roger,